Hi everybody, I'm Tom Chorchi, and this is part two of my introduction to the viola de moire. This second part is my practical part. In it I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that people have sent me and talk a little bit about the tuning and notation of the viola de moire. Before I start, I just want to mention that this print over here is actually called Viola de Moi, and I can't tell you why that is because obviously it's a, a violin cut up and then printed across the page, right? Uh, maybe the way he's got those quite close together, like close vibrations, um, maybe that suggested Viola de Moi to the artist who was Fernandez Armand, uh, um, 1928 to 2005. I only remember that because uh, I got enthusiastic about them and then uh, the artist died and the prints got more expensive than I could afford. Anyway, I'm afraid that the rest of this talk will seem like a long list of hurdles and difficulties for the Viola de Moi. And I don't want to make light of these problems either. In fact, it's kind of amazing that the instrument survives. Keep this fact that there are many difficulties in the back of your mind, or keep the fact that it survives in the back of your mind, it, it, while I go through this long list of um, uh, challenges. And again, my opinions are just my opinions. I'm a self-appointed expert. Uh, so always double check what I say. You maybe should always double check things anyway. It's a good idea. Let's suppose for the moment that you're interested in playing the viola de moi. What should you look for in an instrument? It isn't easy to comparison shop with the viola de moi because violas de moi are few and far between. Uh, so a question is what you should buy, a six string or a seven string? I have actually met people for the very first time on the basis of, uh, what do you think I should buy, a six string or a seven string? Um, uh, that's you, Rui. Um, I used to consider that a six string was a friendlier and easier to approach instrument. But as time has gone on, I have come to believe that the most important thing about any bowed stringed instrument is its responsiveness. If you can shape easily, dynamically, in any register, then you shouldn't turn your back on a seven string. Uh, if you buy a wonderful seven string that is easy to play in every register and you still want to rush to the bottom of the six string in that passage in the Bieber Partita for two violas de more, you can get your maker to make a little resting place on the side of the bridge uh, and you can stick your seven string over there while you're playing the Bieber. Or you could just take the seventh string off altogether. Just don't tell Bill Monocle because he'll go on about how the, the bass bar isn't going to work as well. Looking at you, Bill. Um, okay, the sixth of the seventh string. Okay, the next thing. A viola and Y should be light. Actually, the whole violin family should be light. The violin family and the viola and Y are really an, an amazing achievement of evolutionary engineering. Strength without weight, that's what it's really about. They need to be light so they can vibrate. This particular viola de moire weighed 600 grams before I had mechanical pegs put on it. Uh, now I'll get to the mechanical pegs later. Now another thing to consider is the vibrating string length. Let me put down my bow. Okay, so the vibrating string length is the string length between the bridge and the nut. And on this instrument it's about 360 and to be honest I think that's ideal for me. Uh, it means that in the most difficult music I can make the um, extensions that are there, but the cross fingerings, of which there are many, are not too close together. Let me just give you a quick example of the cross fingerings that I mean. So let's see, I've got, I got my hand in, in view. So that's not too bad in 
uh, first position, but by the time we get to third position, if the instrument is like a vibrating string length of say 343, and I actually own one of those, the cross string rings there are actually pretty hard to do. Uh, so I don't think it should be fully a viola sized string length, and I'm interested that Jan Kral, a violist uh, in the 19th century who actually published a method for viola moi, actually one of the better ones I think, uh, was 1871, and he says in that he thinks the vibrating string length should be 360 millimeters. Uh, I think that is a, as a, as a, something that anyone should consider. There are instruments as small with this short uh, vibrating string length of 330 millimeters, that's violin size. To my taste, those instruments um, really don't have enough sound uh, in the bottom end of the instrument. And the viola sized ones I find too hard to play when you get to the most challenging bits of virtuosic music by people like Franz Kurtz. Uh, now, why are there, is there so much variation in the design of the instrument? Well, the viol noir is a solo instrument, so it doesn't have to be a member of a section and you don't have to compete by brute force for a place in the section, I think. Okay, rosettes. Some violists de Moy have rosettes, and they're still here hundreds of years later. I have no personal experience with rosettes. I don't know what their possible tonal or structural implications are. Um, now, I have something that I can't show you today, but I want to mention because I think it's actually a potentially very useful thing for you to know. So, Maybe the most difficult thing about the viola de moi is tuning, and we're going to say lots about tuning later. Um, but right up to the 1780s, makers were making a gamba-type attachment for the tailpiece. Um, and that was kind of a post that's glued in the bottom block and sticks up and goes through the bottom of the tailpiece. And if you have this sort of instrument, and for a while I had the use of a George St. George uh, 1912 Viola de Moi, I think it was, um, uh, with this kind of a tailpiece attachment, and that kind of tailpiece attachment made gut strings practical for me to use, stable enough. Um, and so I think that there's a reason why makers persisted in making this kind of tailpiece attachment. And as you'll see, uh, even 19th century makers, when they came to copy these instruments for more modern players, also did uh, this kind of attachment. Uh, but they modernized it. They did some very there's some very clever work by some anonymous makers. The uh, one of the curious things that I've learned about the old Moi <laughs> over the last few years is how very busy the 19th century was with historical instruments, and quite a few very lovely instruments were made during this time. Of course, they pretended that they were older. Um, now, the sound holes. I'm not going to generalize about sound holes, uh, because as you saw on that example of the 19th century instrument, they did all kinds of things. Uh, I don't want to and people give these things names, flame of Islam, sword of Islam. Sound holes are necessary to weaken the top so that they can vibrate. And uh, people make all kinds of stories up about it, and I'm not 100% sure that I see what the significance is. I once actually used an instrument belonging to Cornell University, which had double sound holes, kind of like two little commas back to back in this area. and. I wouldn't recommend that because setting the sound post is kind of a um, trauma then. Uh, but the instrument actually works quite well, so I think that there's actually a wide range of things that are actually possible in terms of sound holes. Uh, 
Now, another thing that I get asked is, is there a modern as opposed to a Baroque viola and way? Now, Karl Stumpf was a mid 20th century exponent of the viola de moi, lived in Vienna and published a method called the New School for Viola de Moi in 1957. And in it, he called for violist and white to be modernized in the same way that the violin family instruments were modernized. That is to say that there should be new necks grafted onto them and the new bass bars and larger sound posts and so on. Um, fortunately, as far as I can see, not very many people listen to Carl. Uh, if you are looking for an historical instrument and its historical purity is of importance to you, Actually, you're much more apt to be able to find a uh, intact viola de moi than a violin or, or violin family instrument. Now, another thing is flat backs. This instrument has a flat back and uh, modern players are frequently afraid of these and if they ask their dearest violin dealer what they're apt to be told is that an arch back is going to be louder. Now the viol de moi will always be a soft instrument. It's not only not a trumpet, it's not even a violin. And it's soft because it's under three times the tension. I mean there's three times as many strings. Uh, and an arch back is not necessarily going to help and is actually in the way of some of the features that flat back instruments have that make them comfortable to hold. And these are the brakes. If you look, I hope you can see this on the video. I'm going to have to wait till I get to my computer to find out. But there's actually a brake here and the, the back is folded towards the neck root. And there's even instruments where there's an additional brake at this point here and it's folded down towards the end button. Uh, and those instruments are, are kind of scary from the point of view of the maker um, but because uh, there's an additional challenge in construction uh, but they're actually quite comfortable to hold. Uh, so there's a, a remarkable Italian instrument I'm going to show you a picture of just now and now I'm going to go on in favor of flat backs. Uh, most of them in the 18th century, most, most violas and were made with flat backs. And uh, the ones that I play, uh, I actually prefer the sound with the flat back. You might prefer it the other way, and even in the 18th century, they made arched back violas de moi. It's part of this uh, attempt by makers, particularly later in the 18th century, to kind of save these colorful earlier instruments. Uh, so you'll see arched backs from the later 18th century for gambas and for violas de moi, particularly from French makers. Uh, now there is another choice to make about edges and in terms of the edges I'm actually not uh, a fan of the historical models myself. Uh, I am in favor of the edges. I'm talking about the, the, the here, the point where the belly and the back meet the ribs and form a seam, I think at that point it's really better uh, for me and for most players if the belly and the back overlap the ribs by a millimeter and a half. And uh, this is because when the seams come open, as they inevitably will, uh, if there's an overlap all the repairman has to do is drizzle a little glue in, put the clamps on for a few hours, and you're back in business. It really isn't a big deal. Whereas, if the, uh, if the edges are flush, well, then eventually when you have to glue a seam, the, the um, back and the, and the uh, ribs won't line up or whatever. And that becomes a much more involved uh, repair if you want to actually make them flush again. Now, uh, oh, another important thing, I said earlier that the viola de moi should be light, and one of the things that can help make it light is if the peg box is open. So in this particular case, the peg box is half open. Uh, but actually, 
quite successful stable instruments can have the peg box fully open and I think that's great because it's nice that the instrument is light and uh, that will help make it lighter. Another thing that will help make it lighter is a smaller rather than larger carved head. Uh, now this a large carved head, by the time it gets way out there, it's got a lot of mechanical advantage on you of pulling the instrument down. Um, so smaller is maybe better than bigger. Um, uh, so, and by the way, uh, historical instruments sometimes have scrolls. Scrolls are okay too. Uh, now, one of the things that I only learned, I've been playing the viola noir for 30 years, and only recently did I discover that some of the carved heads were painted. And here is an interesting example by Johannes Eberle from uh, the Horniman Museum in London. And some of the attention to detail on these decorative elements is just extraordinary. And here, note the pupils in the eyes of this carved head on a viol de moi uh, by Thomas Eberle from Naples in 1783. That 1783 mm. instrument is actually the model that this one is based on. This is a pretty accurate model except that this one has seven, seven strings instead of six, six. Now, one thing to know about the carved heads, usually in the 18th century, they were made by a sculptor specializing in carving and grafted on to the uh, uh, peg box by the instrument maker. And very fine work of this very kind is being done today, and I want to show you an example of this by the uh, Dominion Sculptor of Canada, Phil White. Now, moving on, uh, the radius of the bridge uh, is usually, um, the, the curve of the bridge is usually a radius of, of uh, 42 millimeters. Now, I want to tell you that I have carefully measured up historical examples with much flatter bridges than that. Uh, and so far, I've never been able to make one of those work, and I've not been able to find anybody else who's been able to make one of those work. But I'm interested in it because these are very beautifully made examples, um, and there are many of them, there are enough of them, uh, to make me wonder uh, what could possibly be, have been going on, what could have been making this possible. Uh, so, but that is maybe work for the next generation of the old and white players. That's not something I can do. I'm, I can make a radius of 42 millimeters work and that is where I'm going to stop with that myself. Now, strings, uh-huh. I have always used gut strings for recording. Uh, and I think the combination of the sound of bowed gut and wire is uh, what I like best about the viola de moire. It's a little bit like you have the violin and you have the harpsichord at the same time. However, most of the time I have my instruments drum with gymnastics, super flexible. I have also used dominance, but with dominance I've had the experience that the lowest 6th and 7th string can break in the peg box. They'll break the very first time you try to tighten them up before you ever get to constant pitch with them. My theory is that these strings, the, the leader, peg box leader of these strings is very brittle and uh, depending on the diameter of your string, of your peg, excuse me, uh, in the peg box it can make the curve too tight, uh, the bend uh, of the leader of the string too tight for the string to um, bear. Um, when I meet a new viola de moire player, this is the issue that actually comes up. Uh, the, the, the strings that break before you ever get to use them. Uh, also know that the strings will break in the peg box if you crowd them, and part of the reason here is that violas de moire, as I've said before in this episode, come in a variety of sizes, and so the string makers have to make the 
strings so they can accommodate the largest instruments and the smaller instruments wind up with a lot of extra string in their peg box. You can uh, shorten that leader. You only need about four or five windings around the, the peg in order to have the string hold. Um, now, sympathetic strings. Sympathetic strings, I have bought the commercial sets from Parastro and Domestic. Um, uh, the, in my experience, the top D string needs to be treated with cautious care. The other ones I have never had a problem with. Um, I will admit that when I go to change a set of sympathetic strings, it takes me two or more hours and I have to lie down afterwards. It's not an easy thing to do. And it's also why you probably don't want the peg box fully filled in in the back because otherwise to change the sympathetics you have to take all of the playing strings off. Uh, so the open peg box I think is a good way to go, period. Um, now uh, we're about to get out of... Um, uh, oh, now the, with sympathetics you can actually have a lot of fun with sympathetics so you don't have to do the tuning that the, the manufacturer comes up with. Um, so I have uh, done by preference, and I don't have it on this particular instrument at the moment, but I like to tune my sympathetics in the scale, and the only 18th century method for the viol de moi, well actually it's not the only one, it's the only published one, uh, it's the Milandre's method for the viol de moi, 1782, um, and it's on IMSLP, you can get it easily. And it gives a scale as the tuning for the sympathetics, and I'm going to show that to you. Uh, in an example here. Now, uh, 150 years, 120 to 150 years later, Henri Casadesu chose a similar close position tuning for his sympathetic strings, which he explains in his 24 preludes for the Viola de Mai. Uh, I recommend those 24 preludes of Casadesu, by the way, uh, if for an, a place to start on the Viola de Mai. Um, uh, they are in real notation in alto clef, mostly in alto clef, and there are many, many fingerings. Uh, if you get started there, there I have put an errata list on my website for the wrong notes and the wrong fingerings because uh, the edition is not 100% clean. Um, uh, now, we're about to get into the practical part of the playing of the instrument. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start to explain why I put geared pegs on this instrument. The better to tune the sympathetic strings. Uh, with the help of these geared pegs, I can easily get the maximum resonance out of the instrument, which depends on exactness of tuning. Now, there is a London bass maker, Jonathan Hill, who makes traditional pegs, and then he inserts between the walls of the peg box. Uh, he inserts uh, carbon fiber um, narrower carbon fiber shafts. And the narrower carbon fiber shafts, actually I don't know if I'm recording at the moment. Um, I'm actually going to break this off.